Welcome everybody. Uh, today is uh, March 22nd, approximately 4:05 p.m. April. Sorry. At least I'm not ahead of myself. Um, I just want to welcome everybody today. This is the Town Council Finance Committee meeting. Um, we'll uh, begin the meeting. Uh, today's focus uh, for the general public and for the watchers is um, three budgets. The first is community services. Then we'll talk about administration and then public works. Um, for the record, uh, just to note that all the council members are present as well as the town manager. And uh, move, uh, or I'll take a motion to approve minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Excellent. And then we'll move into the budget. Tom and uh, mm -hmm. Bill first. Yeah. We have uh, Bruce Culver and Bill Reichel. They'll so we'll be here to represent the community services department. I did want to direct your attention. There are, uh, is an item in your packet that was provided to you on the uh, SharePoint site over the weekend, but this will be a document that I think Bruce will refer to in his comments. Like that. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is just thank the Finance Committee for allowing us the opportunity to speak uh, and represent community services. Uh, what I'd like to do is give an overview of the last kind of 30 years where we started from and where we are today. Um, I think it gives a historical perspective about, you know, where we were and, you know, the size of the town and the population as it is today. Um, in 1984, we were, we had about 6,000 people in town, one street light at Oak Hill. Um, <clears throat> we were at that point, the recreation department. Um, we're serving now about uh, 20,000 people in town. In 1987, we went from the rec department <coughs> and joined forces with the Community Learning Resource Center, which was the uh, school's educational side for alternative ed. Um, at that time, we formed a commission. We had two, two board members two school board members, two town council members, the superintendent and town manager. That commission lasted for about three years. At that point, it dissolved, and they felt that the commission and the department, still community services, either was under the town manager or the superintendent at that time. Uh, they chose at that time to put uh, everything but the educational component back into the school and kept that under their superintendent and community services uh, came under the town manager. That was in 1987. So in 1990, uh, we're still running most of the rec programs in town. We started with 60 kids uh, and about uh, probably 15 teams, and we ended up with 750 kids and about 60 teams. So if you ever know what it's like to schedule 60 teams, it's pretty difficult. And we were struggling for field space at that time. So over that time and over the course of the years, they've built these community neighborhood parks, which I think has been a great component to, to Scarborough. It certainly has added to the value and quality of life that we have here. So that obviously has helped. We also started a child care program, before and after school program. We had 30 kids involved in that when we first started. We rented space at one of the local church, two staff members, and we now have, we're servicing between two and 300 students um, currently. Uh, we're one of the largest before and after school programs in the state. Uh, so I think that program, again, is a self-sustaining program that's done very well. And I think is very appreciative to the, uh, the parents that, that live in Scarborough. In 1999, at that point, uh, I'd like to uh, have the opportunity to take you to that graph. Um, at that point, we were, in 1999, um, we were 63.1% self-sustaining. We had a council, a sitting council at the time that felt um, we should be between uh, 80 and 90% self-sustaining. Um, and to do that, uh, obviously, we had to raise program fees to cover those costs. So today, we're proposing a budget of 87.2%. Uh, 
which is a 24% increase since 1999. In 2005, we took on the Senior WOW program, the 55 plus program. That was a combination of senior voices and senior series. Uh, 2006, we took over the administrative duties of running the beaches from the police department, which currently took that over from the public works department. Um, <clears throat> the beaches run on a self-sustaining basis. Any extra revenue goes into a special re reserve account. Previous council set that up so those monies could be used for capital improvements to our beaches. I think that was a wise thing to do back then and, and has paid off in the long run. We bought beach rigs, tractors, those things that we needed. We've also helped take some of the money for Higgins Beach uh, uh, bathhouse, uh, Ferry Beach bathhouse, and some improvements that we've made at Kurt Park as well. Uh, <clears throat> 2008, uh, we took over all the cleaning details and the trash removal at the beaches as well. In 2011, uh, we also took on a tree lighting program. Um, these are special events that we've added throughout the year, the winter fest, the summer fest, and concerts in the park we co-sponsor. Again, I think is a uh, big benefit to the town to have those types of activities. And in 2012, in two and a half years, we've done over uh, 1,600 passports and applications to date. So again, another service. So I think we're in the service business uh, if we look at the big picture. So that being said, I'd like to now point out some of our revenue changes. So if you turn to uh, turn to the revenues tab three, page four. I think the two revenues that stick out on those page on those on this page is um, the beach revenue increase of twenty six thousand two hundred and twenty nine dollars or nine point seven percent increase. Um, the other revenue that sticks out in that page is our child care revenue. We've <clears throat> this is a forty three thousand dollar increase over last year, a six point three percent increase, and that's due to program uh, we looked at the program cost and felt that we were in line with where we needed to be and felt that that program could take a little bit more of, of us adding to the structure of the program. So the program fees went up. Is that self-sustaining? Is that, that a is, break that is even? Just, that at is that a, level, it's break even? Uh, we make about $150,000 on that program. To go back to the beaches real quick, uh, over the last five years, uh, 2014, we were at $347,538. 2013, $332,675. Uh, 2012, $305,529. 2011, $281,002. And 2010, $223,766. So certainly more than enough money to cover the expenses of the beaches. So there's probably around, I'm proposing like a $100,000 surplus that would go into that special reserve account. So that, that, that's the total balance in the, the reserve account is 100000 No, balance? the total balance to date is about 300000 Again, that's used, and we cap that to fund uh, all sorts of beach-related capital improvement projects, in fact. I don't believe we've ever used tax dollars to, to fund any of those initiatives, at least in modern history. Bruce, Bruce just clarify for me. Sure. Uh, uh, the line item uh, uh, beach parking revenue, 275 is your estimated parking revenue for 2016. Correct. And where does that money go, the 275? Just uh, it's an arbitrary number that I used. I felt that I could use some of that revenue this year. It offsets our expenses to run the beaches, mm -hmm. but that revenue is money that um, um, I felt could go into the budget to help offset some of our actual programs. I don't have any problem with that. What, what you're estimating is that 100000 would be set aside into the uh, separate account, which is simply sitting there for the purpose of capital improvements or things of that nature. Correct. Uh, and the balance, in this case, 175000 would just be used because it's appropriate to use that amount in your judgment or 
uh, the expenses that you incur. Yeah, and I'm trying to cover some of those costs that, are, that you know, there's not a, a lot of revenue that we generate, i.e., our grounds maintenance. You know, we have a $500,000 expense in grounds maintenance. Well, it's hard to make that up when you're charging $50 a field use fee. <laughs> in fact, we'll get into it, but the, uh, yeah. the, the beach management related costs, operational costs, are programmed at $246,000. Simple point being, this revenue co covers all of our operational expense and a little more, and there's an expectation that there'll be even excess revenues that go into that reserve account that will be used in the future as they're necessary. And Tom, where'd you get that number? Uh, it's in tab four, page 50. It's the beach management portion. I, I didn't mean to jump ahead. I was yeah, just, just, I'm just ahead trying of to sort of follow the revenue and sure. reconcile it with the expenses. So uh, tab four, page 50, is the beach management portion of community services. And you'll see the total cost for 2016 are 246,788. Yep. Simple point is this revenue will more than cover the operational expense and then some. And the, uh, uh, the, the full-time employees is two, which are... Yeah, I was going to go down through that if I could. You would you? Yeah. Uh, currently our... our Operation is divided up into six divisions, if you will: administration, grounds and facilities, recreation, 55-plus program, childcare, and beach, manage beach management. Excuse me. We have 15.5 full-time employees. We have 95 part-time employees, which are hired throughout the year on different programs or events, and 195 volunteers. So as you can see through our administration, we have about 26%. Our grounds is 20. Our child care is 20. Our beaches is 9% of the budget, and our seniors is 4% of the budget, and our recs 21% of the budget. Councilor Donovan, to your point, though, though it says two full-time for beach management, it's actually a portion of two full-time people. Yeah. I believe Mr. Reichel is one of those bodies, 30% uh, and 40%. I figured yeah. that it was yeah. some portion yeah. of Bill's day is spent for each management, and, uh, so okay. I just I was just trying to get a sense of uh, because it looks like if your expenses are 246 and your revenue is 275, mm -hmm. there's a reasonable relationship there already. So it isn't like there's a lot of money left over. No. No, but I felt that uh, we've done a good job managing our beaches. We should reap some of that benefit, and we put it into our program costs. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I don't fully agree. Two quick questions, just going back to the revenue side. Yeah. So, in taking the beach management we were just talking about, so if I understand it right, we have 300000 in a reserve somewhere. Yes. Do you know what you anticipate you might have at equipment needs in the short term future? Because what, what I'm looking at, a lot of people use the beaches. Correct. And so, this will be a form of tax increase. They'll see it as a form of tax increase. And just wondering whether. If we think this is going to generate a hundred thousand dollars surplus this year, the fees you're proposing, mm -hmm. whether you know, as, it, as we look at the total increases, residents are going to see mm -hmm. a lot of people use the beaches. They'll see it. And I have a similar question on daycare. It looks like that's a six percent increase. Mm -hmm. And if, if we're looking at it as a hundred and fifty k revenue generator. Mm -hmm. I'm just concerned about some of those families that use that service. That's that's a pretty big increase. So, in other words, the average participant is going to see a six percent increase in their child care bill. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? So I'm just trying to back my head. I'd have about. to do the quick numbers, but it's somewhere around there. I know we had to adjust some of our figures this year and, and felt that uh, we were adequate. We weren't at the top, but we're right up yeah. there now where we need to be. We're paying a rental fee yeah. and. Previous councils wanted us to be at the top. They didn't want this to be a subsidized program. Right, but if I just make sure I want to understand, though, if, if, if I understand your number, that well, can I when, ask you where you are? I am on <laughs> your revenue schedule. Tab three, page four. Yeah. If I read this yeah. right, you're saying you're asking for a forty-three thousand dollar increase in the fees, and you said you think that's going to generate a $150,000 surplus, so you're more than covering costs. Correct. And I'm just in the back of my head trying to say, as we think about our constituents mm -hmm. and how our various things we're going to do impacts their pocketbook, um, 
so, so I just want to make sure that that's a correct assessment of what you're saying. So it factors into what I'm thinking about. That you think this will generate my, my a $150,000 surplus? Yeah, my expenses are five hundred and twenty-four thousand three forty-four. And I'm proposing my revenues to go up to 730. I've been criticized in the past of not yeah, no, not bringing those revenues up where they where they should be. So I'm trying to get to that 90 percent that I need to be without impacting the parent, you know, all at once. Yeah, no, no. So I feel that that's a fair representation. We looked at those fees. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understood. That yeah, I've got my facts right. So, uh, mm -hmm. so thank you. It, it, because. Am I right that what you're trying to do is match pricing with the marketplace? Correct. So and this is a service that isn't a tax. It's not a fee. This is a service that we deliver that all these people would otherwise go to some private enterprise and get that service. If it was available. If it was this, available. This before and after school program is unique. Not well, a lot of companies it. offer it because before school starts, and it's after yeah, school. Be a lot so of it's hard, it's hard to get staff at <laughs> 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning to do this. That's, I know that. My wife does that. Correct. So I, uh, that's, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. So, But it is a marketplace. It isn't a tax. No. No. I think it's just for those parents that this service because the want schools to are there and we have the ability yeah. to take advantage of this opportunity that we're organized to do. To this Correct. point, we have a uh, perhaps a heightened sensitivity of being, you know, we can we can charge too much and turn business away. There can be a, a diminishing returns, and that's always a delicate balance for them to assess where the market is or what people are willing to pay for youth programs that are discretionary or any of the programs, and finding that delicate balance that you charge enough to be able to offset as many of the otherwise taxpayer-funded expenses mm -hmm. with user fees and not turn business away such that you kind of cut off your nose to spite your face. and. Bruce has been masterful in kind of tweaking that uh, year in and year out. Yeah, because my outlook is that we're, there are services that are essential and mandatory for a municipality to provide. Mm -hmm. Okay, we raise taxes to pay for that. Right. Where they're discretionary, uh, uh, we uh, have the ability to charge a fee, a user fee. Correct. Uh, and then sometimes it's just we're, we're in competition with uh, and even your rec programs are in com competition with AAU <coughs> rec programs. So travel programs. So, so everybody mm -hmm. who wants to participate in these totally discretionary activities has the ability to make those choices. And I think that's a nice division. The marketplace drives one. The, the other is is driven by the necessity of providing the service for the community. Yeah, these are kind of expected. I, it's, it's probably too much to say that anything that falls into community service is a required service. It's certainly expected in most communities of, of our size. Yes, I would agree. I think that, that we should be charging markets. I'll well, try not to do it all. Take a time if we can roll on. <laughs> roll on. You all set? You all set? What do you think? No, I'll just make sure I forget right now. Was a back to tab four, is that where we are? You've done revenues, you expenses. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's tab four, page 38. Uh, so some of the things I've uh, talked about earlier was the organizational structure. Um, obviously, we're in the service business. Our name's community services. We service the public. And I think we do a real good job of that. Um, I think a lot has shown over the course of the years with budget demands and program demands that we've tried to meet those challenges. So uh, our budget drivers, I feel, are our wages and our benefits. You know, there's an increase in wages and benefits, $34,218, or 1.9% increase. And our services and charges, $16,729, or a 9.9% increase and you know those comes from from recreational programs child care programs passports that we do those service type businesses some of our successes this past year um, I would have to say we we worked on a new reservation online process processing processing for scheduling uh, we're still working with 
the planning of the Eastern Trail, and Mr. Reichel and myself are working with MDOT South Portland and Amtrak to try to secure funding for that project to, to finish the, what I'll call the north end of the trail towards South Portland. We're working with the FOSH committee to possibly construct a new hockey rink, and, and Councilor Donovan and myself and Mr. the manager, Tom Hall, has worked with the FOSH committee to try to bring that to fruition with a public-private partnership. Uh, constructing and viewing uh, a, new a new viewing area at the high school con concession stand was built last year, uh, and we just finished installing two solar projects for the town. Those were some of our successes from last year. Some of our goals is we'd like to plant a living tree at Memorial Park, so we're not trying to put up a tree in, in early late de late November. <laughs> early December. I think it's something that over time, if we're going to end up doing this type of program, it would be nice to have. We want to move the Danis Village Archway. It's something that the historical committee has come to the manager and requested that we take a look at putting it at Community Park, Memorial Park. Uh, the TriGen project is something I'm still working on with the manager. Our reader board for out in front of Town Hall. Um, again, the public-private partnership with the FOSH committee and work to finalize the last portion of the Eastern Trail project. Um, this is this part from Pleasant Hill Road to Scarborough River is the portion of DOTCs that's high significant, and I think it will get funded eventually. Mr. Reichel's our rep on the committee at this point. I did it for 12 years. Uh, so overall, we're resulting in expenses of a 2.3% uh, increase, uh, $61,000, and revenues are up $4.7, $92,000. Uh, so we're showing a negative um, decrease in the budget of 4.9% over last year. Um, if you add in Town Hall, which the manager has decided to do this year into the Community Services Operating Budget, that drops us back down to 78% self-sustaining. The reason for that, obviously, is there's $304,000 worth of expense that we had to um, show on the budget with $400 worth of revenue. So uh, to march that number back up to 90, to be self-sustaining at 90% is going to take some time. Yeah, what, what Bruce is referring to really is a function of this new format. I rolled the municipal building, which is always a separate standalone um, department in the, in the town budget. I rolled it under community service under the grounds and facilities. So that was uh, $340,000 in expense that Bruce now has uh, to weigh him down on. It was really done for convenience and reporting purposes. Uh, but it does affect him when he looks at his bottom line as to how he's doing with revenues against expenses. So the uh, table that we were given here yes. does not include the impact of that. So the seven point two percent is outside of municipal building costs. Right, and that's really so you can see that 20 years of comparative data. Yep. Correct. Any One of your questions you said, um, services and charges went up 9.9%. And some of that detail seems to be on page 42 where you have, at least you reference, there's $11,000 increase because of organic program and additional laborers to provide organic. Is it, is it more costly to have the organic program than what's driving that, I guess, is my question. Why is there like a 10% increase from one year to the next? Well, from the three years experience that we've had, um, I find it to be more labor intensive. The, the organic program is certainly something I think we all should strive to do. Um, and I'm a believer in it, but I think at the, the long run of that, where we are with it, the technology hasn't really caught up to, I think, where it needs to be. It's still something I think we need to do. We're in the third year of it. It's, they said it would take between three and five years of, of, of turning the soils around, if you will, to, to make sure that it, it uh, prospers, if you will, to provide us with that lush grass that we're looking for. But what it also has provided us is lots of weeds. And our weed beds are, are, um, are packed, and we have had to hire uh, more college students to help out in the summertime. So that's driven that cost a little bit. So, if you had, so what do you think we're paying as a premium? 
to have an organic program versus a more conventional program? I mean, is it is, is it, it more money? Investment? Yeah. I mean, it, it I, sounds like you're saying it's more money, and it looks like in your budgeting. Yeah. yeah. I think it is a little bit more money. Um, I think it's the way of the future. Um, I think we need another two years to evaluate it and see if it's something the town wants to continue to do. I think organics is, is something that um, we should support uh, in, in, in terms of the five-year commitment and, and take another look at it at that point. I, I won't be quite as diplomatic as Bruce. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we're finding it's somewhere between 15 and 20 percent more expensive, and that's not a great surprise. Uh, what does that mean? Is that, is that it went from about $90,000 to about 120 ish now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so about 30, it's about $30,000 a year premium, you think? Right, and that's over three years. We've completed our first term with the, the initial contractor. We're actually soliciting bids, as we, start, we will this week, uh, for, for uh, organic turf management services. It may well be the same contractor, but we'll have fresh pricing. We also have probably uh, loaded up some of the expense because we've, as part of that project, we've required semi-annual soil testing, which this is really all about changing the soil biology. And if you make the soil good and healthy, you'll have good turf. Uh, so we've, we've probably spent more than we'll have to in the out years in soil testing, really just to get a sense, initially the baseline, and then trying to assess those values over this initial term. Um, so I, I think that's going to fall back, and, and I think Bruce is right. This is the way of the future, and I think this technology and the methodology of application is only going to get better and, and cheaper. Um, that's our expectation. So, can I move on? Uh, any other questions on the expenses? Um, I have one on the um, I knew I shouldn't ask that question. <laughs> um, and it's really a long-term question around fields. Specifically, uh, seeing more and more information about uh, the question earlier around turf fields. Um, how are turf fields going? Are doing? And are we foreseeing any projected issues down the line? Because that was a rather um, a well-discussed issue when it came up. I don't know if I remember exactly. I've been around for eight long. years. Eight years ago. Yeah. I mean, uh, is it sustainable for the next 10 years without any major investment or I mean, the, uh, the life of it when we put it in was about 15 years. So mm -hmm. we're in year eight this fall. Um, I'm, we just added $10,000 worth of rubber over the last year uh, to bring, bring the grade back up, if you will, the playability. Um, so I, I feel that that field should last at least another seven or eight years, and at that point we're going to be looking at uh, some future build out in terms of, of redoing that facility. Our expectation, we do have a reserve account that we're, we're putting monies into. Uh, the expectation is when that replacement is required, we'll have sufficient revenues to, to cover that. Uh, so just, you know, for me, it's another one of the, just like the landfill closure, our reclamation. It's a long-term liability issue that we really should be playing out seven years before maybe five. Um, because it's a significant cost, but there's an expectation of replacement. The wisdom of the council at the time was to direct those monies, and we do charge for uh, for use of that facility. Those monies go into a separate account that's maintained for that purpose. So we believe we'll fund that liability fully when it's required. Okay. Thank you. Um, would you like to move into the CIP at this point? So, uh, one last question on page 44. Um, you've got to talk about some programs that you've got, part of your driver's number of programs offered. Does that mean you, just the current programs? You guys blending in some new programs? Well, I think we do all the time. It's a supply and demand type thing. If someone comes up with a new program and they'd like to see us offer it, uh, we certainly, I, I look to Billy or, or other coordinators in the office and say, is this something we can do that makes sense? If it is, um, then we offer it. But, but it looks like it's an increase. Is there a specific thing you're planning on here, or is this a sort of a placeholder for no, it's a, pla it's a placeholder. Keep in mind, there's offsetting revenue. Um, is that a fair statement? That's correct. So any additional expense here, we don't bring on new programs unless there are fees associated, and those fees are, desi are derived okay. to cover costs. So yeah. Okay. Uh, so presumably, the $4,200 additional expense, there's $4,200 of revenue built Co in. 
Correct. Yeah, you could flip back to tab three, and we could we could probably direct your attention to the two or three line items. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the last thing I'll just say about the balance between revenues and expenditures, um, you know, Bruce is at 87 percent and has almost always shown this creeping upward. Uh, the final 12 or 13 percent are really stranded costs. I mean, one of the stranded costs that we'll never recover. And that really has to do with the cooperative shared services we have at the school department. Bruce's staff does all facilities scheduling. That's all indoor space and outdoor. Uh, but we maintain all outdoor, and in exchange for that, we get use. So there's a good, good relationship there. Uh, but that $500,000 in grounds maintenance, there's really no one to pay that bill because we're getting use in payment, not cash. So I just wanted to cut a flag. How much was that again? Percentage? Well, we're about, about 87 percent, so there's a final 13 percent that is is going to be likely very hard to ever close up. Or, you know, if we ever get to 90, I'll be surprised because it's that final piece has to do with the facility relationship we have with the schools. Mm -hmm. That make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. CIP? Uh, is it tab 6? Yeah, tab 6. Um, for equipment, page 5. I believe there's one. Item of equipment. Yes, this is a replacement mower deck, land pride deck. Our current deck is over eight years old. We've, we've put a lot of money into it in terms of maintenance. We're also mowing about, I'm guessing, between 45 and 65 acres of land, um, which is a lot of land. It's a lot of turning of that mower. Uh, it's really in need of some a replacement of $15,000. We would use it as a backup in case that one went down, which has happened before. Single fifteen thousand dollar capital. Correct. Eleven foot tow behind mold. This is the big one you'll see working most often right up back here. Yeah. Remember hearing about the gate? What's this gate? I forgot. Yeah, the automatic gate system is something we look at. <coughs> where is uh, it? Where is it? Yeah. We don't have it. It yet. doesn't exist. No. It yeah. doesn't <laughs> exist. I thought there was a replacement of an existing gate. No, um, it's something that we we thought would uh, pay dividends to the town in the long run. I think we still should look at it. We're looking for a host company, which would then host the server at their facility. We looked at three different companies. That uh, one came and did a presentation. These uh, actually two came and did a presentation. The third one was in California. Uh, our IT director felt that um, they should be hosting the equipment, and then they in turn do the maintenance of the equipment and any scheduling upgrades that we need at that point. Um, I think we're still going to do the research on it, and I put it down in there as a placeholder. I think that our we have three beautiful beaches that um, there's an opportunity for us to to uh, handle money. Le uh, what's the word I'm looking for? not handle the money as much, so to speak, and, and it would go directly to the bank so and then directly to us. These are automatic uh, gates for the three parking lots at the three beaches. Well, this is really for Higgins Beach only at this point. Yeah, th there would be an upgrade to the other two if we decided to go that way. Um, it also gives us some locking me mechanisms. You know, the gates uh, close at a certain time. People sometimes abuse that privilege. Um, it's it's kind of like paying a penalty to get out. You pay the service charge to get out, the gate would lift and you'd leave. But also our contract is run out with Higgins Beach Inn that over at, at, at Higgins Beach Bathhouse, there's a small parking lot off, off to the right that we lease to the Higgins Beach Inn and that contract is due July 1st, or come due July 1st. So um, the manager and I are trying to work out some of the details there, but felt this might be a time to look at that. So we'll still be talking yeah. with Bob at some point in time to see how we continue for this summer. So it, it, it's another way, and the police department gets many calls about the gates locked and I can't get my yeah, car out. Just finally, the uniqueness of Higgins Beach is that there's uh, early morning interest. Fishermen like to get down there pre-dawn. Uh, we don't and never would want to have staff there to take money at that point. 
uh, and there's actually year-round interest. Uh, more of the surfing community is there in the winter months than there, or as much in the winter as they are in the summer. We certainly don't have staff there, so we're losing revenue during the winter months. So it's something we continue to look at. I put it in there as a placeholder, and again, that could be used for that reserve account money if it's something we decided to do. Just make sure, though, that, that's not in the capital no. budget. No, for next we year, moved right? it out. This, this is Push out. Out. Pushed it out yes. okay. further, but I thought we should at least talk about it yes. so yes. that it was on the table, yes. so there was a conversation about the possibility of looking. I knew our contract was up, and we might want to do something. You have gates now at the Hughes Beach parking lot and Correct. Curry, Curry Park. No gate. No gates at Curry Park. No gate at Curry. No gates at Ferry. Correct. So just we have attendance. And do you lower the gates uh, at? Uh, Beach. We closed the gates uh, with a contract, yeah. and that contract's coming due, so we felt, well, maybe this is the time that we need to look at the bigger picture. Oh, only for the Bob Westbury portion? Mm -hmm. No. We closed the, the parking lot portion at 9 o'clock. Okay. All right. Yeah, I didn't know yep. what that schedule was. Yeah. Then there are two projects under tab 7, page 1. Tom's leaving me alone. And while you're flipping there, I'll deliver some good news. One of the projects is for security system upgrade. We can remove that. We're able to fund that through uh, some existing funds and some good uh, competitive pricing. So that's no longer a requirement. So it's really just one at this point for carpet replacement. And note that that's proposed to be appropriated. And over, we're, we'll expand over a three-year term. So we would phase that in for this building. This building is carpets over 20 years old and really we've replaced it in some places that had higher wear, uh, but there are other places in the building that haven't seen any replacement since we put it in 20 years. So we'll do that over a three year period, 8,000 for each year. That's Thanks, it. Bruce. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, there's only one other thing I'd like to mention. Um, the coastal coordinator position that was in um, the planning department and the public works department is something I think that we as a community need to protect our natural resources. We have the largest coastline in the, in the state of Maine and, and we need to, to as a community, uh, and we need to protect that and I think it's something the council should reconsider or at least put on your radar. Thank you. Just one question regarding uh, the historical perspective of where we've been in community services and recreation as well as where we're going. Um, have we ever been able to do a break even analysis to determine where is that point in which we may have diminishing returns or whatever you would use the diminishment of services when you increase pricing? Have we ever done any type of model that sees where is the, where is the maximum income point? I, I still think it has to, a lot to do with the culture in which you live, where you live. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're charging a hundred dollars for youth soccer in Aroostook County, you're probably not going to get very many kids. But if you're charging a hundred dollars to register down here, for instance, a travel program, you probably will fill that team. And so I think it's a lot has to do with economics and it has to do with location and supply and demand. Yeah. Have we ever seen a point in which there has been a reduction in participation in any particular program or even in all the programs based upon the historical? I mean, when you talk about economics, we just went through a recession, which is kind of, you know, whether you agree where we've been or not, you know, we're on the curve and hopefully coming back out of it. Have we ever seen a reduction in participation based on? No, but it scares me. I think if you, you can price yourself out of business, and I think that we've done it. If you look at the graph, we've done it in a way that I think is, it's been, it's eased us up easily. So yeah, we've not done the modeling, um, and I, I think we're, we've looked, we're much pretty close. I can't tell you anecdotally that I hear a lot of complaints. This, this town, you know, every time I turn around, I'm paying another fee. So it's not just market forces, it's also added attitudes. And I think I'm equally in sensitive to whether it's a tax bill or a fee albeit discretionary, these things. Um, if for any of us who have kids, many of these things are not discretionary. Your kid wants to play, uh, <laughs> do something, uh, uh, it's hard to say no. <laughs> you know, and I'm, and I'm preaching to the choir, if you turn around and have some constituent uh, group that, you know, um, 
you know, community service users don't want their fees to go up. Uh, taxpayers don't want their tax rates to go up. Uh, garbage disposers, users don't want their bag fees going up. I mean, no one wants, everybody wants more services than no one wants to pay for. So, it's a challenge. <laughs> it sure is. Sure is. One last question. Going back to the proposed increase in the beach fees, mm -hmm. is that to Scarborough residents? Is most of the revenue from Scarborough residents, or is most of the revenue from visitors? What you're doing is that? Uh, the day passes is what we're looking for. And when you say pro proposed increases, that, that's money we're already collecting. You know, for the people that are a using our our beaches that are residents in town or the tourists from out of town. So that you projected an increase next year. So I'm just yeah. wondering, predominantly, are those because like I know I buy a season pass. Right, and you are get a good going, deal. Are those going? Are those going up? Or no, is it, no. Those are the, fees, day, are the day passes no. mostly visitors to our that's correct community rather than residents? Do most residents buy? I'm just trying to figure out. Who it was close to 2,600 resident passes we sold last, last year. year. So, and a couple hundred. Not yeah, we, we've priced them such that any resident who has any interest in going to the beach is you know, more than a handful of times. It's just foolish not to get it. And, right. and as, as evidenced by, we sell 2,600 of them. Um, so it's increased demand that's driving the revenue up. Yeah. The price is the same. The price is right. staying the same. And the price oh, is set, isn't it, by ordinary? Yeah. Right. I thought you it were is. changing the fees. No. Yeah. No. No. no, no. The price is set I'm making more it. revenue. I'm just reaping some of that benefit instead of putting it in the reserve fund. Bruce doesn't but have the authority to, to establish a different yeah. pricing structure. Oh, so it's all no. volume. It's, it's, yeah. It's yeah. The council decides how the price is set. In years past, I think last year, we actually did propose a change to the fees, and the council endorsed them. But we're not doing that this year. Yeah, we actually have a schedule of fees. Yeah, right. That's coming. As a technical yeah. matter, you approve that schedule of fees as part of the budget yeah. order. Yeah. It's then, a, then, then, am I also confused then on child care that your the increased revenue is going to come from more volume, mm -hmm. not more, fees? No, more volume. Ah, okay. I didn't. I missed that part. Thank you. Yep, I probably Thank didn't you. explain it well. Thank you. Uh, when you try to set uh, uh, fees. Uh, do you do it based on, for like youth soccer, mm -hmm. do you do it based on trying to maximize revenue or do you do it based on what you think so Portland and Cape and what other, how do, how do you make it? I base it on what the council's wishes are. <laughs> <laughs> so it's whatever I can get great that makes the most sense. <laughs> There's a reason that so. he started here in 1984. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen a lot of change. <laughs> no, but first and foremost, our requirement is cover costs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We start a program, we need program revenue to cover itself. Sure. Uh, and then there might be a little extra. That's been the drive. Yeah. Correct. Cover the costs. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for uh, going over a little bit for us. Thank you both very much. No, thank very you. Much. So, administration? So there's uh, some revenues, uh, the term in this book on page, tab three, page one, executive revenues. Uh, really not much noteworthy other than, um, I, I would note we're looking to make a bit of a correction on accrued sick uh, reimbursement. Uh, these are monies that we have reserved um, and it's really um, to grab a term from the school discussion of reconciliation. It's really uh, a better reflection of what we actually expect that we're going to pay out. So these funds actually come from established reserve accounts. The only other thing I would flag, uh, this council will hear a workshop as soon as your next meeting, perhaps certainly a meeting in May, uh, regarding a proposal for another, uh, for two microcell lease opportunities from Verizon Wireless. Um, I mention that because uh, to the extent there would be lease revenue associated with that, and I don't want to presume anything, uh, it would show itself here. We're not talking about huge money. It's probably seven to $8,000 is my guess. Uh, but the existing um, cellular lease leases are reflected here at the three fire, or two firehouses and one park. Any other questions about these revenues? If 
not, I could direct your attention to tab four, page, starting on page uh, two, one, excuse me. Back on here. Uh, obviously, one of the things that jumps off the page here is the, uh, the, the wage and benefit lines. And the way we handle these uh, for non-union, uh, and in this case, two different union uh, contracts, we put all the potential um, salary and benefit expense, or excuse me, salary expense here, really for a couple reasons. One, to isolate it so we know exactly where it is, and should it be approved, then it's apportioned out over the appropriate payroll lines. But it's, it's identified here, and we need to be uh, fairly nebulous in conversation around the union components, because there's two open contracts that we're negotiating as we speak, and there are financial resources to settle those. Uh, we do, I'm pleased to mention we do have tentative agreement on the dispatch contract and would like to talk to the council and share the details of that in executive session uh, in May. So, um, and, and I can I can say we're within budget uh, with that tentative agreement, so we're in good shape. Um, I've invited Jacqueline Mandrake here with me. She's the HR director, and I think it might be helpful to provide a little context on our efforts over the last three years, this being the third of in the final year of implementing a new pay classification and pay system. Um, so if you'll indulge just for a moment, I think that might help just provide some context. Thank you. So in February of 2013, we went through an RFP process to partner with a consultant to provide a job classification and compensation study for 85 non-union full-time positions. That impacts about 95 employees. At that time, it had been more than 10 years since we had a good um, a consultant take a good look at our positions. So the objectives outlined for that study included reviewing and revising the classification system, collecting wage survey data from our competitors in the national market to see if, if our positions are benchmarked correctly. We looked at our uh, exempt and non-exempt positions to see which positions we were paying overtime on and, and which maybe we shouldn't as pos positions change and evolve. We needed a consultant to take another look at that. Um, we, we asked for a recommendation for an index to determine an annual COLA. So that was something that the consultant provided. He provided the employment cost index, and I can get into that in a little bit more detail if you want. We also asked for multiple implementation options so that the finance committee at that time could, uh, if needed, phase it in over several years. And then the last piece, a second phase, was a performance evaluation tool, again, for our non-union full-time positions. And then in July of 2013, we partnered with Condry and Associates went through uh, quite an extensive process. They came on site several times. They met with the Finance Committee. They met with employees. They looked at our job descriptions, our org charts. Um, it, it was fairly intense, and I'm pleased to say that last July, the, the council implemented the program, the, the compensation piece. Um, we are, this year, proposing the second plan of that which is the evaluation and merit piece. So this budget includes a 1.25% merit increase for 23 employees, as well as a 2% COLA that's connected to the employment cost index. And that index, um, while not as common as the CPI, is very similar. It actually measures employment costs, which includes the inflation of wages and employer paid benefits, and it breaks it out by sector. So there's an index for civilian workers, for private industry, and then state and local government workers. So as you can imagine, the index for private ind industry was over 2%. It was about 2.2. Civilian workers was 2.3. And the government employee index was 2%. So that's the, the money in that line for full-time COLA as well as part-time non-union COLAs. Does that include a, a benefits component? The study? The, the COLA. Um, the, the municipal employment uh, CPI. It does. It measures employer paid benefits. That's correct. Thank you. And the 23 employees, and there's nothing magical about that, that was the number that came out of our really first time doing a thorough um, merit, excuse me, performance evaluation system for all non union employees. And 23 folks out of about 100 in that category um, had been recommended and we proposed funding to actually fund those merit increases uh, this year. And again, that's 1.25%, so. So, um, 
3.25% of $840,000 last year is related to the change in merit and COLA. The remaining is um, roughly what percentage is uh, benefits related and what percentage is contract changes. Um, so benefits would be um, included in the department budget. Okay. Then we ran a separate projection with a COLA and then depending on each employee's elections, a percentage of, of those benefits went into that line. So it really is unique to every person. If someone has right. a family plan versus single coverage, that percentage is all included in there. Right, so um, I'm, tr I'm trying to uh, um, lessen the gap between, on the $298,000, 3.25% of 840 is roughly, and I'm just rounding, it's gonna be somewhere around $25,000. Correct. So I'm trying to find out where's the other $270,000 well, approximately going to. Well, w wages and benefits for this category includes all the wages and benefits specific to administration. On top of that, there's this extra piece that's plugged in that affects all other parts of the budget, okay. uh, many other parts of the budget, if you will. But again, we, we isolate it for purposes of proposed budget. So I, I don't think you can do the math the way you're approaching it. So if the COLA is approved, we reallocate the COLAs into the department budget. So we just isolated those costs. Yeah. Rather than, we could, we project them for every employee, we could actually reflect them in each and every one of the appropriate wage and salary lines. We think it's better for this purpose to isolate it so we know where it is. If there's a change, we can affect it easier and we can identify it, uh, call it out. Yeah. So let me approach the question in a different manner. Okay. So you had indicated that there's some contracts that are currently under negotiation that's impacted by that number. Um, without getting, because um, without disclosing anything that might violate confidentiality regarding that because of the negotiations, um, is this a fair estimate of what is needed? Uh, is there going to be a few potential future adjustment downward or is there going to be a need to go upwards as a result of those negotiations? I'm hoping that we um, would not need any additional money, that this is an accurate representation and hopefully see some, some salary savings potentially. Well, and frankly, with an approved budget and, and with that a limitation, we would make certain that any agreement we come to would live within our means. I did bring copies of the performance evaluation tool that we use this year in case that's something of interest. And again, um, I've asked for an executive session to give you a detailed briefing on those uh, union matters and I can be far more explicit in, yeah. in those numbers. This is the year of evaluation. Yeah, this is a, a tool that uh, I would say worked um, <laughs> quite well. Um, we're getting some feedback and evaluation on the evaluation form, as funny as that sounds, and going to be modifying it slightly based on the feedback from staff, but uh, generally speaking, it, it really did serve the purpose well. Um, I'm excited to have an evaluation process that really rewards and incentivizes em employees that are doing exemplary work, and, and that's the goal. Um, and, and we spent a lot of time meeting with, with employees and with managers and getting feedback on how to make this a meaningful process, not you know just a rote thing that we all have to go through, but employees will develop goals and hopefully gather some professional development opportunities and, and work to round out their positions as well. And I really want to acknowledge Councilor Blaze, who at the time this proposal came forward three years ago was the champion of the merit piece and really uh, pushed hard to make sure that was a, an important component and I'm pleased he did. I, I think we'll be well served with that going forward. And we'll um, improve it each year. I'm sorry. Um, so is this only provided annually or is there a semi-annual um, process great, as well? Great question. So right now it is annually unless you're a new employee and then a new employee would have a six month review as, as a probationary at the end of their probationary employment. I think Jacqueline also uh, distributed a revised uh, staffing plan. Yeah. Uh, we noticed that there were some errors in the total calculations. It replaces the 
the one that was in the packet and provided tonight. Okay. And I should just provide quick context. We don't need to, to go into that in detail, but uh, Chairperson Holbrook had asked me to prepare this. She's been on this council for seven years now and has appreciated um, some of the things we've done on the town side to make these budgets work. And th this was an attempt to really capture what our experience has been just before the recessionary period and, and through the current fiscal year. So you get a sense of what's happened in each department by way of staffing. I would mention that for fire and police, there are a bit of anomalies, fire in particular, because call division and per diem are included in this evaluation. Um, and to that extent, uh, we did provide some additional information. I think you've already seen it actually from Chief Thurlow. Uh, Chief Moulton provided something, as did um, Jennifer Lim on IT changes. It's just, again, we don't need to talk about this in detail. I just provided this con some context for you. And we've done this, thankfully, without layoffs. We've done it by virtue of opportunity through attrition and you know, people moving on and creating a vacancy and us uh, rethinking how we can um, continue to provide the service levels uh, with, with less staff and, and have been able to do it um, so far so good. There's a, a, a reduction of $50,000 in the other class line item on page yes. one. Administration. Ruth, can you assist at all in that? I say that just because remember this format rolls up a lot of smaller numbers into those uh, those larger ones. Okay, I'm sorry. This page, is the page one. The overview of administration, the so-called other costs. I can find it. I believe a lot of it has to do with savings for unemployment and workers' compensation. Uh, those two together are $30,000. I'd like to make a quick comment on the workers' compensation, too, because you may know that the workers' compensation costs are a percentage of payroll, so traditionally those are going to increase, and it's really outstanding that those costs have gone down. It says a lot about the work our safety committees have been doing and our, and our claims management. And I, I, just, I think that's a great, a great job across the board by all our safety committees. I stand corrected. The difference there, Council Donovan, is the eight outside agencies. Um, right. What, can you explain that for us? Every year the, the town is asked uh, by local social service and, and other types of agencies for funding uh, of one sort or another. Uh, historically, I've not included that in my budget. I see that as a council prerogative, with the exception of Project Grace that's always been viewed as a bit of a different one because they're Scarborough based and Scarborough specific, and I believe actually save us money on the general assistance line, frankly. So I do include funding for that, but I don't include funding for all the other requests. So it shows as a reduction. Um, that is finance. Pardon? It's an addition out someplace else? Because there's $79,000 being requested for outside agencies. Right. That's uh, at your election. If you, uh, I've not included any of that 79 in this budget. So oh. I'm just trying to speak to the question of why is there a $50,000 reduction? That's why, because certain agencies were approved for funding last year, and I have not included them in my proposal. Does that make sense? That was a long-winded answer. No, the, the 2015 budgeted number of $64,700 equates to the allocation of outside agencies. Yes. Sheet. Mostly. Mostly. Yeah. It's a round number, so I figured it, it had to be mostly all. <laughs> But, but Tom, so the, so if I heard you right, this proposed allocation, none of these dollars at this point are the number of you've seen, right? No, with the notable exception of Project Grace, $10,000. The Project Grace is still in. Okay. Last year's budget on the uh, Exhibit 5 allocation outside agency, mm -hmm. last year's budget being $60,000, $10,000 of which was Project Grace. Mm -hmm. You put in the budget, so 50 thousand uh, reduction from a sixty thousand dollar budget would mean the project grace money is still in yes. the budget as presented. 
the 12.5 that's in the other No, it's not 10. It's a 10. And the request and, is for 12.5. Right? And in fact, requests are at 79,000. That's and I think last year, as I recall, the finance committee and the council approved something less than was asked. Is there a point when you want to have us ask questions about this? Certainly. Uh, we could either do it this evening or at your next meeting. I didn't know when, uh, when was it was scheduled. Okay. I, I just want to balance this out, though. So project rates is 10 grand with 4,700. Is that also? Who are, the, who are the other agencies that are that are included in that under other costs? Or is the 4,700 not agency related and just other costs that aren't kind of I believe it's not agency related. Okay. I'll, I'll check that. Uh, well, he's, well, I mean, I don't know that is. Um, and actually, uh, relating specifically to that with the agency, I've always felt that We've always had this struggle, no matter what year, even in the great years, uh, on you know why do we pick one particular group and not another? Um, we have to, you know, should we give a little bit to everyone? You know, how do we really balance that? Um, and I know over time we try to take that step to only those that are critical to the community as far as what we are providing, what is saving us in the other areas. So I appreciate that Tom has done that. Um, the question is that um, some of the values that are in here are going to be very significant impacts of those community programs that have been receiving it. So as an example, $7,500 to Opportunity Alliance is a, is a significant amount, as well as the $9,300 from last year for VNA, which is the Home Health and Hospice. Um, and especially given uh, the level of hospice care services that are provided in this town and we have, you know, on the, uh, the homes that we have, it's a tough. It's a tough discussion, yeah. and we don't have a policy around who, why, when, how much, or anything. It's well, we have routinized the process. Colette Matheson, my assistant, runs that. We can provide you the questionnaire. We've required them all to fill out, so at least we're getting uh, the same information. And we we ask questions along the lines of, tell us more about how you serve Scarborough residents, so we can make some qualitative decisions. All of that supporting material, this is just a spreadsheet to capture name and total, uh, is available on the SharePoint site, uh, and I encourage you to take a look at that. It's, it's, it's loaded full. To answer your question, the other $4,700, 700 of it is uh, contingency, which is council's contingency, and uh, $4,000 for the land trust, which technically shows itself under general government, but for this format and this report, it shows under other costs. Shannon, I guess, I guess for me, I'm not sure where this conversation belongs. I, I've gotten a lot of emails about this, yeah. and I know I served for many years on the allocations committee for United Way, mm -hmm. and it got to a point where people are really, um, really want, United Way was kind of forced to change how they did things, to say, allow people to choose the agency they want to give monies to. I have a problem with us taking taxpayer dollars and making decisions about which sort of agencies we want to support. So I, I know it's a lot of money and it's a lot of change for agencies, but I'd like us to have some type of conversation about should we be making the choices for our residents on where we send charitable contributions or the equivalent. And I, I also have a second issue. If you look at a lot of these, a lot of these are associated with big health systems like Maine Health. I mean, uh -huh. Maine Health has several of these entities. Um, they have pretty healthy balance sheets. So I'm not sure. So I'm not. I, at some point, I'd like to maybe talk about an exit strategy that we're not in this place. Other than maybe project rates that we've talked about, or other things we can talk about, but giving monies to the main health organizations. Some people may take exception. That's what I've heard. You know, they want to choose where their their dollars go. They want to be in control. So I. The good part is that the managers aren't giving us an exit strategy because he hasn't included it into the budget. That wasn't well, my intent. <laughs> Yeah. Other than Project Grace. Just um, as an aside, historically, one of the things we talked about, and it doesn't speak to your fundamental issue of using taxpayer money, making decisions for taxpayers, but uh, making an allocation to someone like the United Way, who have perfected the art of allocating uh, to where need is, um, and removing us from that discussion, because it, it's really a tough one, and it's hard to make good value judgments. I'm, I'm very interested in that conversation. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm also wondering if <coughs> it's more philosophical than budgetary, whether it's really right. a, a seven-person town council workshop for 20 minutes than, than it is for the three of us to, to talk about it. Uh, because Peter raises a good point. You know, uh, how do you make those decisions? It's always difficult. And uh, there's a uh, uh, parallel uh, line item for uh, senior uh, uh, low-income property tax relief mm -hmm. for $130,000, which is in the budget. It is. Uh, which I think is, you know, a direct assistance to those in the community in most need. And it flows directly to them as opposed to filtered through agencies that they may or not, may or may not benefit from. Right. So, that, that, I think those two seem to deserve a discussion together. Yeah, as a practical matter, what's happened in the past is a number, a dollar figure has been arrived at through this process by recommendation from the Finance Committee and, and ultimately approved by Council. And then after the fact, some conversation with it by this Finance Committee or the full Council, a discussion of allocation is, is then had. But you don't need to make that decision today. It's really how much do you want, if anything, to set aside. To set aside. Um, Two questions. One is, uh, or a couple comments, I should say. One is, on the senior tax credit, th there is a council policy that directs the manager on how to apply the policy to the budgeting process. Correct? Is that right? Well, there's a, there's a policy clear policy. policy that dictates eligibility, and eligibility determines the, the uh, how much money. Right. So, um, to the extent, um, I hope that we don't have a 20-minute or even a five-minute workshop to talk about $60,000. Um, I think that maybe our recommendation could be for us to refer the matter to the policy committee to come up with a policy statement about outside agencies and how the manager can then um, kind of meet our philosophical needs on, on behalf of the entire council. Um, personally, I think, though, to be fair in the discussion, to take it to the next level, um, we really should also include Project Grace just, to, just so that we're not showing any bias in any of the agencies and then, on, then allow the council to decide as a whole on how to treat them all. Maybe there's one allocation to the United Way or to some outside agency that then parses it off. Um, with, some, with, our, with our statement that there's a preference there for a particular group, I just, uh, and I'm not trying, I love Project Grace for what they do. They do so much for us, but I think that to be fair, we need to apply that across the board to all requests. But just a question, is there enough time frame for that to happen and to go back to the well, we policy and, and come back for the final budget? Um, I think that we can make, I mean, it's a month, so it depends on the policy committee's ability to come up with a two-sentence statement about outside agencies and what the policy could be. And we could then approve the policy as part of the budget, which then determines the amount. It depends on who's on the policy committee. Okay, Mr. Dunn? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Two of the three sitting with, with the committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, so I'm happy. Yeah. 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 That's right. I think it belongs right here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have to thank for that. Okay. Any other items uh, for administration? So again, for organization purposes under administration, I include executive, the legislative piece, which is very small, legal and insurance, and Jack and I was going to mention just we, we have some good news with insurance. We're finally starting to see some benefits from our efforts in safety and, mm -hmm. and such. Both workers' compensation and unemployment are showing a decrease, so that, that's outstanding. And I'm sure that was it called the state award? Yes, exactly. That probably contributed significantly, especially on the workers' comp side. 100%, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're seeing a $24,000 savings or 6.7% uh, benefit or reduction in workers' comp costs. That's great news. Employees are safe and we're saving money, so it's a win-win. So on to town clerk. I'm sorry. Town clerk is comprised of two basic functions, obviously all the clerkly functions. Um, I'm sorry, Tom. I, sure. Um, I wanted to ask one question, and that is um, the most unpredictable cost in every town municipal budget is legal expenses. Uh, you never know who's uh, going to be upset with you. So the question is, is that I believe that there's $80,000 being projected. It is a decrease, sorry, it's level to last year, which is significantly below the 14th. 
given the circumstances that we're in without getting into details because of the confidentiality of lawsuits, is that enough? Probably not, in all honesty, but it's, it, it is a bit of a um, shot in the dark. Um, I, I would very much like this committee, and actually there's a policy that requires the Finance Committee to evaluate legal services. Yeah. Uh, we've been with Burns Insure for 30 years, and I'm not suggesting we get bad service, but I think it's high time that we evaluate our options, and there may be some potential for savings. And actually, uh, under Charter, we're required to look at this, but also look at the accounting services. Auditing. Uh, yep. Auditing, I'm sorry. And um, so that's an item I do have on an agenda after the budget cycle. Right. So we can only get through this budget. And it may well be we stay with Bernstein, but we're able to negotiate better pricing, frankly. Um, I, I just have never had that conversation with them. Um, so I, so in this particular case, if everything else works out evenly, all revenues come in even, all other expenses except for this one comes in evenly, where does any excess um, would have to come out? Is that general fund? Is that yeah. the allocation from other budgets? So if it actually comes in at $200,000? Well, we, first and foremost, I try to stay within the limits of the, of the yeah. budget. If I can't, then it uh, goes to fund balance. Yeah. Um, okay, fine. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. right. Town clerk, there's uh, essentially two functions. One is all the clerk related functions. Um, two full-time staff members, um, and then the other component is the elections portion, and there's 52 part-time staff associated with that effort, and about 10 volunteers. Tody runs a very tight ship. She's one of the departments that's working two-thirds of staff. I mean, there used to be three full-time people in the clerk's office. Uh, and now there's, there's only two. And uh, it's really remarkable the volume of work uh, they do every day, servicing the public with a smile. And really the elections has, have become a, a huge burden. Um, just the complexity of state laws around elections. And, uh, but they handle it all with grace and, and uh, handle it very well. I don't think there's much to really report on. Um, And then that leaves human resources. There you go. And that leaves human resources, and Jacqueline's here to speak to that uh, that aspect. Human resources and general assistance. I have the honor of overseeing both. The human resources budget has a modest increase of 1.9 percent, and the general assistance budget has an increase of 3.8 percent. So the total increase for the two department is 2.1, and on the general assistance side, you may have been following some of this already, but the, um, we've increased the food and the housing lines in that department due to anticipated state cuts in programs such as SNAP, which is the Food Assistance Program, and TANF, which is the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families Program. So um, I met with our general assistance coordinator, Rainey Daniel, to go really line by line to see what our anticipated needs are. <coughs> And we do draw on resources in the community, such as Project Grace, that they've been a great resource for us. Yeah, I, I want to be able to document it better, but I'm certain as I look, and, and we've done some kind of analysis with other communities, and the amount of general assistance we provide, and, and I just want to be clear that if someone comes in, the eligibility requirements are what they are, dictated by state law. So we don't refuse someone. If they are eligible, they receive benefits. Um, it strikes me there's some phenomenon. People aren't getting to us. They're finding resources elsewhere, and I, I personally believe Project Grace is, is a, a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And at least for me, that's why I think they might be, they should be treated, or at least talked about differently than all the other outside agencies because they are Scarborough-based and Scarborough-specific and saving us tax dollars, frankly. We have a great partnership. Um, Rainy Daniel will pick up the phone and call Project Grace. If, if our ordinance doesn't allow us to assist someone with tax dollars, they'll come in here and be serviced in other ways. And Project Grace is usually the first phone call that he will make. So that's it for the administrative areas of budget. Uh, no capital projects uh, under that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we have Mike Shaw with Public Works. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> I'm all warmed up for you, Mike. 
I feel kind of weird sitting down here, Tom, but all right over, you know? Do you want to take a break or do you want to forge right into it? No, we can go ahead. Yeah, right? we'll go ahead. So there are revenues, uh, tab three, page seven. And there might be some adjustments that we should make here. Yeah. Pray so. I guess that's our answer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The, the budget you have before you. Uh, good afternoon. I, I'm joined here with Deputy Director Dick Collins. The budget you have before you today, uh, there is some revenue built into that and some uh, reduction in uh, operational expenses that uh, we're factoring in a September 1 start for a pay as you throw. Mm -hmm. And so, um, based on last week's um, work council workshop, I, we were holding up and we were looking for direction, but I assume that we're tabling that for the time being. Okay. Yes, we need to do so. We'll probably need to make that adjustment at some point so that we can have a proper uh, at, the, at the committee level and not just simply waiting for it to go to. It'll still have to be approved by the full council. But we'll, we'll definitely adjust the note. Okay. Both, uh, and to keep in mind, just for the public, so uh, to uh, Mr. Shaw, so Paige Row had estimated $400,625 for net income, um, should say income, resulting from the pay as you throw trash bag program. But there will also be an additional expense of, I believe, $139,000 that will have to be added back in as well that would be covered. So um, keep that in mind when we're going, looking forward to that. Okay. Correct. Okay. Well, let's get into revenue then. Uh, as you can see, uh, pub public works uh, in general is not uh, not not a department that uh, has, a, has an inordinate number of um, opportunities to, to generate revenue. Um, just hitting a few of the high points here. Uh, you'll see that there is a, uh, a $63,000 increase in revenue for intergovernmental reimbursements. What that is, is uh, each one of the, each public works is responsible for uh, doing vehicle maintenance on all of uh, town vehicles and the school department vehicles, uh, well over 200 vehicles. And so that number right there is the aggregate of what is planned to be expended uh, by department, um, and then that those 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 uh, those those various service and parts lines from each department get aggregated, and they show up in the um, uh, vehicle maintenance line as an expense. This is the offsetting revenue for it. This is the school's uh, figure showing up as revenue on the municipal side. School and, uh, and all yeah. other departments as well, other than public works. Public other than and, public and, works. And, and actually, public works operations. Deputy Collins' uh, operations also uh, puts in what their expenses are going to be. So, yeah. at, at the beginning of the at the beginning of the of the budget season, we will send out a um, a request for information regarding what folks, what what departments are going to spend on fuel on services, so labor rates, and then also what they expect to spend on parts based on historic, their historical needs and that sort of thing. We then get those numbers back. We basically, we add them all together, we aggregate them, and then that becomes what shows us this revenue here of uh, 1.4 million. Um, it's an additional 63,000. Now those then, now as we get back, when we go into our operational budget into vehicle maintenance, you'll notice that there is a service line and also a parts line. And those two numbers roughly meet what this is as well, and also the fuel. So if you add vehicle maintenance parts, services, and fuel, you add those together, you should come up to close to that number. Um, so that's, that's a, that, that was a, a large increase. Uh, you will also see above that that there is an, an, a line called Ecomain Commodity Recycling. Um, we had it in 2015 as a revenue of 36450 We're basically taking that out. Where that ended up, when EcoMaine decided to do away with all assessments, the board of directors said, okay, we, we understand those assessments were doing a number of things. They were helping with, with operating costs. They were 
Um, maybe they were flattening the line, so to speak. So recycling is an example where it's it's, it's very much uh, uh, it's very much economy driven. Um, the, the the markets are up and down tremendous amounts, and so um, what was decided was when the, when the assessments went away. Um, we were going to, we were now going to be, as, as, as owner communities, we were going to be entering the market, so to speak. And so uh, if we made money on the recycling markets after all the expenses were factored, then we, got, then we got a share of the revenue based on the tonnage that we delivered. And if we were losing money after all, all in, we were going to be paying. In my budget again, you will see that there is this uh, there is this revenue here, but there is an expense in the in the in the um, solid waste line, which doesn't exist anymore either. Um, because of what has happened and because of the financial situation of EcoMain, um, it is what what they did this year and they plan to do again in the following year. Um, is there was a five thousand dollar reserve five hundred thousand dollar reserve account set up. And so that $500,000 reserve account was set so that if it costs about $50, $50 to um, process a ton of recyclables, bailing wire, so forth and so on. So in what, we're selling, what we're selling at is that or a little bit less. And so actually it's less right now. So that reserve account is, is taking that dip. And so it's not being passed on to the communities. So. That looks like that's going to happen again this year. I feel confident in saying that we don't need to have it in there. Look, we don't need to have it in the revenue side, but we also don't have it in the expense side, and we'll see that in a little bit. And then, uh, you know, obviously, uh, as we said earlier, the, the pays you throw revenue of 400000 we're going to be removing that. And then, uh, so maybe some, some, some real money or some good news is a $6,000 increase in the, uh, in the LRAP or Local Road Assistance Program. And that is uh, state funds, that is a portion, is a percentage of the fuel tax that is shared amongst the communities. And that number is a solid number. Uh, talked to Pete Coughlin up, in, up at the, the DOT. He said to hold what we uh, were expecting to get this year, which uh, the final projection is the 321,000 in FY15. And then lastly, uh, of, of note, the uh, state EMPG grant, the Emergency Management Planning Grant, this is a grant that was secured by Chief Thurlow. Uh, it's going on its Fifth year, I believe, at this point, um, we receive uh, we, we we get allocated out of that grant twenty one thousand um, dollars, and that is that that's actually pays for about a third of uh, Stephen Buckley, who is the GIS coordinator, uh, pays for his uh, for for his salary and benefits, and because Stephen does a lot with the with with police and fire and their dispatch GIS and. Uh, does uh, the enhanced 911 uh, informational things and, and that sort of thing. So uh, that's why we receive a portion of that, and uh, it's been a wonderful program so far. Um, so that's revenues in a, in, a, in a nutshell, if anybody has any questions. No, I do want to ask Tom, Tom I know I mentioned mm -hmm. this before, but do you have a school development impact fee again? Would it be, I'm kind of estimating, um, just to kind of explain where I'm taking Tom you and I have talked about this, so I think it was in 2001, 2002, no, 2002 was my first year on the council. We developed our growth management ordinance that include these uh, development impact fees as well as others for other areas. So the argument was that the purpose was to help defray the cost of um, increased expenses. So I was kind of hoping that maybe we could get a historical view of what all the impact fees relating to growth management, but particularly the school development impact fee. Um, I think it would be helpful in evaluating it against the increase in cost of the schools for the same period. Okay. If you don't mind. Ruth, are you listening to that? It's not for <laughs> 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 yeah. If not, I've got a note here. Those are as new people that go home to the stuff has been a school impact fee that they've paid in and the correct reserves someplace. You're just looking to that um, I don't believe it's reserved. It goes to the general fund, doesn't it? And it just goes into revenue. We, oh, it is reserved. Okay. So we can provide some historical overview of what the yeah. um, income has been in, in the current balances and in, in the like. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Should we move on to the operational yeah. budget? Okay. 
Tom, tab four, page 71. Yes. The operational budget, uh, the, I, this new format is, uh, is, is worked out very well uh, for, for me, and it, it's, uh, I, I like the way it lays out. Um, so moving ahead, uh, the, the overall public works budget, and we'll get into the various details, but the overall public works budget is, uh, is, is as it stands right now, is at a proposed $330,000 increase, or about 5.2%. Um, as, as an aside, uh, with the, um, if the pay, pay as you throw had been in here, uh, it, it stayed in, it would have been a $189,000 increase, or 3%. So, uh, the majority of the, the the majority of the increase uh, is seventy seventy thousand dollars of this is uh, related to uh, wages and benefits um, increases for staffing, and you'll notice that my total staffing at this point in time is thirty point five thirty and a half full time uh, positions, and that is still uh, that is still down from an all time high of in two thousand ten we had thirty three uh, staff at that time. And we, in, 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 at that time, we underwent a reorganization of the department uh, as far as how supervisor managerial staff is laid out. And then also we took advantage of uh, some retirement positions that we didn't fill. And so that was how we ended up at the 30 and a half positions. The 30 and a half is, um, does include the, the one full-time entry-level position technician that we currently enjoy. Uh, just started here as a half year position and that's an entry level mechanic. And although it's a new position uh, in, it's an additional body, the position itself was left, has been left vacant for about two years uh, when we had a floor mechanic move from there into managing the parts room. Uh, and so we left that position open tried to do what we could without it, realized that uh, this was an opportunity where we, if we had an entry level technician come in, we could then use these, the experienced technicians that we have to do more technical things. It made sense to do it. And so uh, last year, for this year, the council approved that. And then the other neat position, that half, obviously we don't have a half body walking around any place, um, that is a shared position with, uh, with community services. And so, the rationale behind that um, was we recognize that uh, financial times are difficult and so we need to um, be as effective as possible. Uh, I think if you asked me or you asked Bruce if we could use a full-time person year-round, we'd say, heck yeah, give it to us, but we also understand the, 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 uh, the realities of, of what's going on. Um, our major need was in the winter time to create another plow run. Um, you know, the, the level of service uh, expected, and thank goodness we, we got them up and running for this winter, that's for sure. Uh, so we take this person um, from November until April or May, and then uh, Bruce actually uses that person to do some beach work in the, uh, in the summertime. And so this is the first, uh, this is the, we're, we're going we're to start into our first full cycle. Um, this person just came on towards, really towards the tail end of, 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 uh, of the summer. So. Uh, um, right now, the person that we, you know, it, it takes a unique person to do, to want to do that, to split. We got lucky. Uh, the person has worked out fabulously at uh, Public Works. And also, uh, you know, what, what little bit he did in the, in the summertime towards the end, uh, the, the, I know Community Services is very happy with him as well. So that's, uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's a real high point, something that we should, uh, you know, I, I think both Community Services and I should celebrate. So, um, we can go down through each each one of the divisions. Uh, you can see we're broken up into five divisions: admin, operations, which is the typical uh, public warranty type stuff that folks think of; fleet maintenance, utilities, which is uh, that catch-all of hydrant maintenance, uh, street lights, and that sort of thing; and then sanitation, which is curbside collection and all those other waste-related things, such as hazardous waste drop-off days and that sort of thing. Um, Admin. Uh, admin is, is just that. Uh, admin consists of myself, Deputy Collins, a receptionist, and my administrative assistant. And also because there is, uh, we need to we need to kind of uh, collect various various divisions. The GIS also is uh, is in here as well. Um, and so I think it's uh, 
quite interesting that uh, you know we're, we're at a 2.2 percent increase there for for admin, and I think some of these budget drivers I, I certainly won't read all of them, but uh, there, there's there's some that are, are are very much in the forefront for me right now, and one of them being an unfunded state mandate and federal mandate, uh, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination Program. Uh, we recently, in December, early in December, went through a uh, an audit with the EPA for our town-wide stormwater program, and uh, there was definitely some costs associated with that to get ready. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, the the environmental version of lawyering up, I guess. You know, we had to had to have uh, some some consultants uh, work with us to get uh, make sure we were all set to to go for the the uh, the audit and so forth. So there was some costs associated with that. Um, and that's not going to go away. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, you, you will uh, you, you will hear me say this uh, as, as years go by. We're in our beginning of our third cycle, five-year cycle with this program. Uh, each year has become more onerous and onerous. Um, we do our best to bargain out with the with the with the uh, with, with the EPA to make sure that we're, uh, we're we're doing what we're trying to do, which is clean up the water, which is a great thing. But at, a, at but try to be cost-effective and reasonable with it. So I think that's an important piece. It's a big budget driver for us. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, obviously funding, just like uh, just like any other um, organization, it's 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 funding, but it's also consistent funding. And where and 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 trying to read the tea leaves as to where that's going to fluctuate and that sort of thing. So I think that's very critical. And I think it's pretty telling to see that you know, with five folks. Uh, we we uh, dealt with uh, 13, a little over 1,300 uh, requests for service. These phone calls come in, and uh, they're either addressed by myself, Deputy Collins. Um, we are, we're also uh, we also have Operations Supervisor Dave Pinkham behind us today too. And uh, you know, so we will we will go out, we'll investigate, take care of these, look these over, and and then uh, affect the proper repair uh, for that. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we, we're seeing a trend. Hopefully, this trend continues up in 2014. We did 121 life, uh, um, permits uh, for excavation, and hopefully, that's uh, that's on the trend up. That means uh, revenue for all, and that's a good thing. And then I also want to mention that uh, you'll notice that there were 30,000 hits on the townwide GIS system. That system has done a couple of things. Uh, it has slowed down traffic in the assessing office. Uh, a lot of those are real estate-based hits. Uh, the other thing that uh, that, that 30,000 talks about or that the GIS does, uh, back when the GIS position came on, uh, prior to that, we were paying to have a, a consultant do the parcel updates, uh, the, the assessing office was. It's getting done on an annual basis, maybe twice a year if we were lucky. Steve, Steve Buckley, who's the GIS person, does those in-house now, does them at least on a quarterly basis, much more real-time, that sort of thing. And back four or five years ago when we started doing this, we were estimating we were saving five to $7,000 a year. I can only imagine it's more than that now. So that's another thing to consider as, as we think about that, that position. Yeah, I can keep moving. Yep. Make sure we can get through all your yep. divisions. Yeah. Um, because of time, um, I just wanted to ask, um, this is a pretty basic budget. Sure is. Um, there's a, I only have one question, I, and I don't mean to demean, I, I, I just don't want hey, to yeah. have a I, that you need to paint state one go through each of the budgets when they're, I mean, your wages are consistent with every other budget based upon what the HR manager provided, you know, with the 3.2%, so with changes in benefits, even if one line item is a little higher than the other, to me it's consistent. I only have one question for you, and that's it. So as long as the other councils aren't offended by kind of expediting this, you have on the operations side on the services and charges an increase of $240,000. So the question I have is what does that focus in on and what's the need of Sure, it was a tough winter, wasn't it? <laughs> 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 and, 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 and that's exactly what it is, Council of Maybine. Uh, my my budget philosophy is is. Uh, I, next going to be worse. Well, I'm 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 projecting that I have a barn that holds 3,000 tons of salt okay. that has about a pickup truck load in it right now, <laughs> and 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 100 130 thousand dollars of that is just that. Um, so, I'm sorry, 130 is the replenishment. 
transfer yes. it back to stock. Yeah, yeah. In years, in years past, you'll note that in years past, I've not, I've not asked for that. But that's because I, when I come into budget season, I have an idea about how much I'm going to need to replenish, and so I budget accordingly. Um, so 130,000 of it is that. Fifteen thousand dollars of it is additional um, in the roadside uh, mowing and maintenance lines, and that is what uh, th that is the budgeted cost for additional care and maintenance of the new uh, of, of a number of traffic islands that we that we've created over the last three to five years. Uh, you have them on 114. You have them on a couple of locations up here on Route One. You have them out on Payne Road. Um, so those are. Uh, that's just something we can't continue to to do on a on an on a fill-in basis because it just gets ahead of us, yeah. and so that's that's part of that. That's oh, right. That was maintenance of those uh, center yes. islands. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, and then another portion of that is, and I uh, forgive me for not having the exact numbers, uh, is related to my the, right. a, a lot of this increase in, uh, in that you saw in uh, intergovernmental revenues is my increase. Right, vehicle parts and labor is 105,000 of yeah. that. Yeah. So that's 105% that's still an expense, but it's, yeah. From Peter to Paul. Yeah. 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 And, and, you, and you know, you call it a counter expense, counter. Yeah. It's real back to accounting. Yeah. Could I ask a question? I, I've been pressing Mike on the salt sand thing. Is it possible for us to build back our stockpile over a series of years rather than doing it all at once? So you have the first big <laughs> I, 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 I think that concerns me. I mean, I, I can understand where you would think that, or that might be. It's an approach we can take. The, the, the actual issue is, is cost, but actually even availability. Um, mm -hmm. The last two years running, uh, private contractors have been shut off completely. And this year, I know that, I, I know that when we tried to get salt, we were, we were rationed a couple of times. Correct. Yep. So that has to deal with Castle Bay Harbor, right? Because it's being frozen. Yeah, we get the salt in here fast enough. Sheer use and and and, and use in other places. Um, the, the the last two winters have been so difficult that it's it's a case of getting it here, but also the fact that the mines can't produce it quick enough to meet the demand. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. The thing I heard us is when you have snow here, that's one thing, but when you have snow in Boston and you have snow in New York, their demand for that salt is greater. Yeah. So that takes it away from us, so they start rationing it. And they give them greater priority, too, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> the majority of the states in the U.S. have snow on the ground this year for the further than usual. Yeah. I, I think just, just one, not to belabor it, but just one, one quick thing on, on, on parts and labor. Uh, the, the municipal, the, 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 fleets that, the fleet that we have is an international, uh, international brand fleet. They have they've really held a stranglehold on the municipal market for Class Six trucks that that meet the price point and it just kind of they've owned the market. Over the last few years, there have been a couple of manufacturers, Freightliner being one of them, that has come online with a Class Six municipal spec truck, which has a heavier frame and is an aluminum body and that sort of thing. And they're very competitive. As a matter of fact, the last three or four trucks. The last four trucks we've purchased have been freight liners, and all indications are they're going to be more reliable and that sort of thing. The other thing to keep in mind is that while all the other kind of increases are in the 2 to 3 percent, consistently you're seeing in vehicle maintenance in the, in the parts, uh, whether it be for, for, a, for, a, uh, for a car or a heavy truck, you're seeing a 10 to 12 percent uh, increase in parts. On top of that, what you're seeing is more unitized pieces. So for instance, uh, when we have a speed, when we have a speedometer in a truck that is not working, it's a multiplexed unit. You don't buy a speedometer anymore. You buy a dash panel that has the has the you know the amp meter in it and so forth and so on. It's just the way it's, it's the way things are trending. So you know. Um, capital. Capital. A number of important capital projects. Okay. Uh, let's see, so do you want to go for capital equipment or projects first? Equipment first. Okay. Yep. Six. Capital equipment. Try page, page eight. So, trying to keep on schedule with our replacement schedule, which is a plow truck on an annual basis, a light truck on an annual basis, and then a specialized heavy piece of equipment. And 
So plow trucks, we replace one a year, which puts us into our 16th year when we are turning that truck out. As a kind of a benchmark, American Public Works Association recommends a 10 to 12 year replacement cycle on it. Uh, because we have the ability to maintenance the, the equipment in-house, because we have the wash facility, and most importantly, because we don't hot seat, we, we have dedicated drivers to our plow trucks, we get that additional lifespan out of them, and I think it, it, it shows time and time again. So I'm trying to replace a uh, single axle truck this year that is a vintage 2000 International and we will be uh, asking for $180,000 for that. Uh, we are going to be reusing the stainless steel hopper sander as we have in the last three or four, uh, three or four purchases and it seems to be working fine so far. Uh, the light truck this, hap this year just happens to be uh, the vehicle that I run, and that is a 10-year vehicle uh, that's got well over 135,000 miles on it. Uh, again, as a benchmark, the American Public Works Association says five to seven years on a changeout. Uh, we've consistently been getting those 10 years, and it works out fine, and it also, with our uh, number of vehicles we have allows us to purchase one vehicle on an annual basis and kind of gets that routine going for budgeting purposes uh, town-wide. Um, I'm sorry, that was a 10-year-old ten year, ten year old vehicle with 135000 Yes. Pretty good mileage, actually. Yeah. Getting that 13000 a year. Yeah. Wish I could do that on my own here. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we're actually... Uh, with all due respect, Mike, Mike doesn't really need a pickup truck for work purposes. I mean, uh, should there yeah. need to haul something, there's other vehicles. So we're looking at some sort of other crossover type vehicle, not unlike what the police department runs. Right. Uh, more fuel efficient, yeah. uh, will serve the purpose of transportation, but we don't need a payload capacity. Right. And then lastly, in this year's budget, I am asking for a uh, to replace loader 4014, which is a... What year is that? 2003. 2003. Uh, we, we had asked to have it replaced three budget cycles ago, uh, but obviously with the budget being the way it was, uh, we, we've, we've held off. We got an additional three years out of it, but uh, the, the, the rust and the time is just really starting to show on it. Uh, that is the one vehicle that is at the shop during winter operations, does all the loading of uh, salt, sand, and, and that sort of thing. The other, we have two loaders. The other loader is out on a dedicated plow route. And uh, I'm asking for $175,000 to purchase a new one. Uh, that does include uh, an, an estimated $65,000 trade-in value for the existing unit. So um, that's, that's where we stand with that. So that's, that's the three pieces of capital equipment that I'm, uh, I'm asking for. How bad It runs like a deer. It runs like a deer. The specialty pieces of equipment are very, are very difficult because we rely on them so heavily. And they're not something that you're going to run out and grab, especially in the winter, op winter months, because anybody that has anything to lease has got it already out dedicated. And so it's, we, we, get, a, we get good residual value for it at $65,000. And so it's, we're, we're kind of playing that playing that line of good residual value, having reliability, uh, you know, warranty issues. I mean, we're, we're having, um, having a lot of luck these days with warranties on our new equipment and that sort of thing, and so that's, that's helped us along the way as well. So that's another thing to, to factor in, too. Does I would I would say no. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's still probably if we're getting ten plus years out of these things and we're still getting sixty five thousand dollars out of them, I suspect we couldn't lease something for that kind of money. If we didn't have a first rate vehicle maintenance arm, uh, it might be a viable option. But because we're able to take such good care and extend the life life expectancy, it really makes sense to, for us to own. I just I want to clarify, Mike says, I'm asking, you know, these aren't Mike's personal toys. These are, <laughs> uh, uh, no, but uh, generally, yeah. Yeah. And then Mike said, Mike, same, I was going to actually ask, because you brought up a good point, is that there is residual value to the equipment that we're um, expiring or retiring from the fleet. So there's a, there is sometimes a perception out there that we're stockpiling. When we buy new stuff, all we're doing is stockpiling and we either reallocating so another somebody else gets it or we're just keeping it, but there isn't, there is a revenue component to that that's netted. The other thing I hear, and you might as well, is a lot of folks, you know, Mike's crew takes pride in their equipment. It is, uh, it looks good. 
uh, they wash it frequently, I don't know, daily, but um, that level of ownership, um, people often think that these are all brand new vehicles. I mean, there are trucks that are 15 years old that look much newer because of the care and dedication they provide. Um, the two numbers are the trucks that you see in yellow will be the first number is the year of the truck and then the other number is the unit. So a lot of them will look at it and say, it's actually a 2000 Four? Yeah, that actually is what it is. We'd like to have a session with finance on our vehicle replacement schedule mm -hmm. um, that we have in town just so we can provide the rationale for um, um, cycling these vehicles out before they start costing us and why they're still worth something. My stepfather was a uh, road commissioner and that yeah, coastal area was passed for 50 years. Getting $65,000 residual value on that loader is pretty darn good. Thank you. So then there's a capital projects, if you're done on the equipment, uh, tab 7, page 6. Two of these four projects have some sort of outso out, out, outside funding associated with them. And I think that in general, um, you know, I, I understand, we, we understand as a, as a department that uh, we're going to have to uh, work with other agencies to, to get some of these projects done. And I think it's, uh, it, it's worked out well the last few years. The first project that we'll be asking funding for is uh, Pleasant Hill Phase 2, which is from Route 1 into um, uh, the railroad bridge uh, by Rigby Road. Phase 1 was done last year, and that Phase 1 project is, uh, is almost complete. It'll be, it'll be completed this uh, spring with some minor cleanup and paving. What's the, what's the timetable for the Pleasant Hill reconstruction? Phase, phase one from Rigby to Pleasant Hill is done, as you know, yeah. and then phase two uh, is pending approval of, of, the, of the funds from the council to go ahead and do that work. The work that's going on out there right now is water main replacement in preparation for our scope of work if we are approved. So associated with phase two, this project that I'm asking for, I'm asking, uh, we, we are asking for $700,000. Uh, additional, additional beyond that is $500,000 that has been committed by the MDOT already through the MPI Municipal Partnership Initiative Program. So the, the DOT has committed $500,000 for phase one, $500,000 for phase two. So there's a million dollars that they're putting towards this re rehabilitation and re rebuilding of Pleasant Hill Road. So, um, is it under contract, the phase two? At this point in time, no, it is not. Uh, we're we're looking we're looking at potentially working with the same contractor, uh, but it is not it has not been finalized yet. So there's no timetable for when the work would be done. So, so we'd like to do it. I mean, as, as soon as as soon as funding is approved, we're going to go we, we're going to go to work with it. I can't rightfully sign a contract committing yeah. funds that, that aren't appropriated. So believe yeah, me, everyone is. So the fiscal year begins. We're told the budget's approved. Or the budget's approved. approved. Yes. Yeah. Then you can move. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so likewise, Cummings Road project. Cummings Road project is an interesting project. I was uh, I was approached by Doug Howard, who is the public works director in South Portland last summer, and he was asking if I was interested in working on my portion, the town's portion of uh, Cummings Road. Cummings Road goes from Payne Road up to Running Hill Road. And Doug had indicated that he was already talking to the DOT again for an MPI, uh, Municipal Partnership Initiative Program, uh, funding for that. And so we started doing some initial engineering. And that project, again, we have uh, dedicated funds of $500,000 from the DOT to be split between uh, South Portland and, and uh, um, Scarborough. Uh, and then on top of that, our uh, commitment would be an estimated $495,000. That particular project has a couple of components going on with it. Uh, the complete reclamation of the, uh, of the roadway, new pavement, and also associated with that would be, uh, because that is the Red Brook watershed, uh, that is an impaired stream, there would be some at the intersection, which I think is really neat, it would, be, would be at the intersection of Payne Road and Cummings will be some uh, stormwater treatment pieces. Uh, some felt, some tree, tree, tree box filters and a few other types of different uh, um, water quality um, type projects, and so it'll be a good display project as well. Uh, people can keep, people can check that out as they're as they're, as they're waiting at the light. So that's uh, it's a pretty exciting project as well. Um, the mid-level paving 
this is a project, this is, this is a funding that's been going on now for at least five to seven years. And what this is designed to do, this is, this is a, uh, a pot of money, if you will, uh, this year be $543,000. And this, this CIP, what this does is this is a, is, a, is a funding mechanism for doing more elaborate projects that uh, don't rise to the level of a contracted project like a pain road where there's deep, deep uh, drainage being put in and that sort of thing, but we want to take and do a more enhanced project, so additional ditching, some minor pipe work. Uh, typically, these road, the, the road is, uh, has a full depth reclamation, is ground up and graded, repaved. Uh, at that time, we look and see if there's an opportunity to put widened shoulders on for pedestrians and bicycles, those sorts of things. Uh, a couple of examples of some projects that have been kind of earmarked for this upcoming year are uh, Gorham Road from County Road or Route 22 back to the compact line by Running Hill Road. That will dovetail into the, the DOT project that's going on there. Uh, and then another one would be Spring Street uh, from uh, Muzzy to Gallery Boulevard, uh, and then Muzzy Road itself, uh, there'd be a piece of that. Uh, and then Commerce Drive, which is, if you notice, is in pretty, big, pretty bad need of uh, help, and that would be some milling. Uh, in some, some place like that where you have subsurface drainage, you have to bring an actual milling machine in, mill a couple inches out so that you keep your, your reveal for everything. Uh, so that adds cost to the project, but also makes, adds longevity to it. And the reason that it's in, in the bonded area is because that it is a minimum life of, t of 10 years, more like 15 to 18 years, and that's the rationale behind it at this time. And then my last project is uh, one that uh, we're going to have to move on. And uh, by 2018, the two 10,000 gallon fuel tanks that are in the ground uh, in the industrial park over where the school buses are parked, those have to come out of the ground by DEP rule. Uh, they, they we're meeting the, the life expectancy of those tanks. They've got to come out of the ground. Uh, it makes sense to bring them out of the ground and bring them over to Public Works, do an above ground system. Um, when these tanks were put in, Public Works was not where it is now. That's why it ended up where it is. Um, the original plans for public works show an initial a, a final build out. One of those final build out elements is the fuel tanks over there, and so I'd like to uh, at least start the process with that, and uh, see if we can uh, see if we can get the the uh, permitting, the planning, and all that other sort of stuff. Some of the groundwork done this year, and that coming yeah, through. Uh, why does that need uh, complete reconstruction? Well, I mean, there's, there's there's little or no road base to it. It's very rutted out, um, and it's just it, it's a heavily traveled road, very and traveled. so uh, it just is is a uh, is an is an infrastructure improvement that is. Uh, We're talking from the main road up to Target. Yes, yeah, yes, to, yeah, to the top of the hill, to the top right of the hill, yeah. till the town line. Right. How yeah. does the allocation of the project cost? Go with sub well, uh, we we will we will be paying our our portion on on a footage basis. Uh, the the split of the funds will be actually is going to be 50-50, and that that is because uh, project management. I've, I've had the town of Scarborough have very little direct involvement with it. Uh, they Doug Howe and South Portland has very much taken the lead on it. They've got a lot of administrative costs and so forth. They've absorbed. And so that'll be that'll be an offset to some of that. Okay. Just to the out years, I want to flag. I've encouraged Mike to uh, bring Gorm Road, this is the section here from Sawyer Road. Uh, to Spring. Is that right? Sawyer Road to mm -hmm. Spring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just past the library and up toward eight corners. For any of us that's traveled, it, it's one of the only east, west, north, south, east, west, east, west routes in town. Heavily traveled. Um, Little or no shoulder, open ditches, and in just really rough shape. Uh, no there is no <laughs> shoulder, so it's a it's a critical piece of infrastructure and one that I really encourage I, in terms of getting bang for the buck and, and residents seeing the value of the investment. Um, I made the suggestion that we leapfrog over the East Grand Avenue reconstruction, which has been pushed further out. Um, thinking that's a higher priority. So that's a conversation for a future day, but I think um, we really need to pay attention to that. Actually, that's, that's I, I apologize, Tom. You, you, so you're, you're, you're making note of that as it's in this, this, this upcoming fiscal year? No, 
I was just flagging it for future. Flagging it for future. Okay. And, and really enjoy it. placeholder there for something, right? Yeah. Yeah. But my reason for mentioning it, Mike and I have both heard from folks down in East Grand and, and really are looking forward to some improvements. Mm. Uh, we need to make some value judgments as to where should we invest mm. limited resources. And I'm not diminishing the importance of that. Well, I guess I am. I'm prioritizing other projects in front of it. So I, I just wanted to flag it and mention it so Mike doesn't take all the flack. I'll take it. Yeah, um, two questions that I have <coughs> on, on, the, on the project. On the mid-level, um, what's your cycle as far as um, going up, you know, with your staff or whoever the experts are going out and looking at all the roads? Do you do that on an annual basis? Do you do it every two years or you segment the town up to see what is needed? Um, I mean, the last two winters alone, last year was more about cold yeah. um, and the impact and the wear and tear on the roads, and this year was about snow. So what's your cycle and how do you identify that? We, we do, uh, we, we have a split up, we have the town split up in thirds. And so, um, Excuse me. On every every three years, all the roads are uh, are, are um, surveyed. Uh, basic road surface management system principles uh, for pothole and spalling, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but also factored into that is the um, level of service it gets, so the amount of traffic it gets, and uh, whether it's a connector, local road, and that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, and the last question is: Have you ever received any? Um, I can't remember the specific complaint that I got, or at least the recommendation, I should say, make it more positive. Um, there's one road, and I want to say it's, either, it's um, I think it's Broad Turn or Beach Ridge, when you come at nighttime, or even in the morning, the sun, the way the sun rises, when you come over the ridge, it, like, it, it just bears at you, and there's a light there. And I think it's um, like the intersection of Beach Ridge and, and uh, um, Broad Turn, the full way intersection. And, and so I, um, I'll, I'll get more details for you, but there's been a request for us to maybe consider putting in a roadside light rather than the top light because you can't see it when you drive in either direction. That either it time could be Beatridge and Holmes. Maybe that's what I know. I'm sorry, I got my directionals wrong. Beatridge yeah, and Holmes. That, yeah. Bringing in maybe like a solar type of light to bring it lower because um, I think even a couple of people said there's been accidents as a result of that. So, but you do take those into consideration when you when you look at that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, the last question I have is that has there been any um, conversation about um, uh, the expansion of the Eastern Road, um, at not the end that uh, goes down to the Sanitary District because that's not really a thoroughfare by any means, but any expansion of the Eastern Road that's between um, uh, Black Point Road and Portland, the corner of Portland Farms Road because of the number of walkers and the deterioration of the road in comparison to the walkers and joggers and bikers and, and becoming somewhat of a problem, especially as more people are trying to divert away. It's like, uh, you know, traffic is like water, so going take the path of least yeah. resistance or what they think is least resistant. So there's a lot of traffic that's basically taking a left out of Portland Farms, going down a Black Point Road, congesting at that light. Well, not, it's not really, yeah, it is a light, but it's a yellow light unless somebody pushes the walk through button. And there's more traffic going down Portland. I mean, that uh, Black Point Road is incredible. The the Eastern Road has is, is actually been a has been a conversation for us for the last two or three years. And the reason that it's not on uh, not on on the radar for this year or next year is because that there is talk uh, that uh, there, there's going to be a gas main uh, expansion. Oh really? Okay. And and not and, and is there is there already there was there was already gas on Eastern, isn't there? Okay. But the transmission main itself, because what is the, the uh, Northern Utilities is looking to uh, add gas, so they're looking to run gas down that section of the eastern that you're talking about to, to create a larger transmission main, which would then get up onto Route 1 and head towards, towards Main Med and towards South Portland eventually. And so I've actually been in conversation with them, uh, Joe Renda from, from Northern Utilities, uh, to collaborate with them so what, that when they do that project, which is going to happen in the next year or two, when they do that project, rather than have them do any trench patching or anything like that, sure. we're going to collaborate together and make that into a larger project, which is typically what I try to do with, with, with capital projects, is uh, work with the utilities that have, that have facility they may need to replace and, and, and try to leverage some of their funds for, you know, pavement restoration and that sort of thing. Just the, the, the issue of pedestrians, there's undoubtedly a lot of walkers and bikers on there. 
uh, that will be a bigger challenge. I think you're talking about resurfacing it yeah. uh, as opposed to creating a well, separate it, yeah, Resurfacing will help because just from a traffic pattern, one, that way you're not trying to avoid a big hole in the, I mean, there's not too many, you take care of it very well, but it's just that with the runners, walkers, you, you literally will stop where you are because of the walkers. They look at you like you can move um, a, a, a one-ton truck out of their way so that they can continue walking in a, a path, and they're in the road. The uh, they can't do anything else. I mean, I'm not blaming them because there is no other place for them to go. But I'm just, it's, 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 at, it's at a point, that's all. And that culvert crossing is going to be the pinch point. That's going to be very difficult. Unfortunately, the phenomenon is you pave a road, people drive faster on it. Uh, <laughs> and just because you put sidewalks in doesn't mean they're going to walk in the <laughs> Any other questions? No. Well said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Tom, thank you. Yes. Um, to kind of close up for the budget, I just wanted to uh, really mention because the next item is really part of the future meeting. Um, I really wanted to uh, thank all the department heads and um, the team leaders or, or the supervisors as well as well as with Tom. This is our first chance at going through a very new budget process that um, was extremely valuable and I think it was not only valuable for us as counselors uh, but also for the citizens that have been really involved and have been able to see that qualitative discussion that's not only here but that's within the document itself so um, I really want to say thank you for the work that you did. I know there was a lot of hours and times and it's a new process and change can always be challenging mm -hmm. in any environment um, so I, I really wanted to say thank you. That ties into really the next conversation which is what, I, what is our next meeting for public uh, notice, our next meeting is actually April 29th. The town council has decided that it will meet. Um, the town council's finance committee will actually meet from 4 to about 5, 5.30. Um, the sole purpose is to really focus in on the municipal budget. Um, and although the municipal budget may technically include the school department and the school revenues, that will be excluded from the conversation. So we're only looking at those revenues and those um, expense uh, categories that are related to the municipal budget. Um, and we're saving really the schools to kind of uh, maybe uh, come back to that later after the forum because that evening, that same night, starting at 7 o'clock, we do have a public forum. I uh, want to make sure everyone out there knows that it is at the high school. Everyone is welcome. Uh, both the municipal uh, budget will be presented, um, which will show the full impact, of, by the way, of both. But then there will also be a subcomponent in which the school board, um, the ch chair of the finance committee, will present the, their budget. The goal of that is really for myself and for Chris Diazzo to give a macro presentation. However, we're going to have Tom, um, Tom Hall, our manager, as well as the superintendent, Dr. Antwistle, as well as um, their senior staff there to answer some of their questions because we all know that you can go from macro conversations to the weeds really quick and it's about the experts being able to provide the level of detail so that um, uh, they're there to answer that. So it is an open forum. There will be a Q&A process. It's going to be moderated by uh, Kevin Freeman, uh, who is the chairman of the SECO Board of Directors and a very active member of our community and has done things like this before, so I'm very excited and want to thank him as well. Um, and if you want to, there is a link on our website, the town's website, as well as the schools, in which you can go on there. Um, there is a direct email in which you're welcome, and we encourage advanced questions so that we can prepare bring the data, maybe we'll have a slide or two to kind of emphasize that data. Uh, but we're also, you're encouraged to, um, if you don't have technology, you can come into town hall and there's a box here. There's also, I believe, a box in the schools, um, uh, or at least there should be. Um, and you can also, of course, give us a call. All the counselors, I think, are open to taking questions. Um, believe me, uh, it seems like everyone knows about the group email, so uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll get a few emails as well. But we'll make sure that as many as uh, questions as possible can be answered in the time frame. Uh, just keep in mind one piece, and that is that not all the questions can be answered because we only have a little amount of time with a lot of information and a lot of questions. Our goal, though, is that the questions that we aren't able to answer, we will get an answer for you. We will then provide an after-session um, uh, resource where the, Q, uh, the questions can be um, um, reported or in a kind of a journal entry as well as the answers so that citizens can go on there and use it as a fact check or as a opportunity to get that answer and then do follow up if they wish. So um, looking forward to that, although I'm still working on the presentation, I'm a little nervous, but uh, <laughs> I promise to uh, uh, do my best. Um, outside of that, um, I did want to mention we have discussed as well May 4th mm -hmm. as having a meeting. Um, and that's really to take our first shot at really the school budget. 
And what I mean by shot is to find out where our common um, understanding of their budget and then how it molds and folds into the overall budget. And that's where we get into the, the nitty gritty of um, tax rates and spending and investment and whatever it might be in the whole process. It's really a, a fruition of what we've done so jointly with the School Board Finance Committee. Um, because we need to get um, that information out quickly because our final reading is the 20th. Um, any other information regarding future meetings? Tom, would you anticipate for the April 29th forum that you would uh, update the municipal budget in light of the pay as you throw uh, uh, well aspect? I mean, this committee's not taking any action, but that seems like a pretty clear foregone conclusion. Uh, let me. Let me provide a comment that might answer that. Um, what I intend to do, because we've been keeping track, and, and uh, though you've not taken any action, we've been keeping track, and I'd like to have you start your meeting uh, on the municipal budget next uh, next Wednesday at 4 with kind of a starting point, so maybe we can get you to that point. Pay as you throw will be part of that. Now, obviously, we're meeting just moments or hours after that. Um, I think there's some things we can anticipate and we, we should uh, factor into the presentation, yes. So at 4 o'clock, when we look at the municipal budget, uh, we'll be able to look at an updated. Yeah, I'd like to, I'm going to give you a short list of changes that I recommend. Uh, yeah. It's territory you've already covered, uh, but it will be in kind of a summary format. Uh, whether you take action and vote on those that night or at a future date, Remains to be seen, but uh, so I can share that. So the goal between Chris and I, uh, Chris Giazzo and I, in our presentation is to be uh, succinct, uh, provide some synergy, and I, I will share at least on my presentation that one of my slides. Um, we, we try to agree to minimize our, our conversation to five to no more than ten minutes, which is five to no more than ten slides. Um, I will have a slide that balances the conversations that we've had, so it includes. Because nothing has necessarily, nothing has been approved or changed, which includes the school's adjustments mm -hmm. that they presented to us of uh, the 1.3 million. So I will reconcile those known facts because we know that the pay to throw is going to be eliminated. We know that the school's budget will be reduced an additional 1.3 million dollars based on their own recommendation. So I will include that um, in the presentation and, and provide at least a here is before the others. Because the fact is, is that um, we're hurting cats. Um, everybody has their own project that they want us to look at, both on the revenue side and the, you know each individual component is about finding the compromise. For my presentation, and even for Tom, to be fair, you have to go with what has already been presented, because we don't have any idea what everybody else wants yet. I, I think it does make sense, though, and we can talk further yeah. uh, about with some qualifications, saying we've made you know these numbers reflect these sorts of changes without any authorization necessarily or right. action taken. I, uh, but I, I think it makes sense to reflect where, the best sense of where we are at that yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. May 4th, uh, tentatively scheduled for what time? I'm not sure if we can, uh, it's evening, 6.30 or 7. 6.30 is the earliest I can be here, but that doesn't mean you can't start earlier. So why don't we say 7 to be comfortable? Get out of work until 6. Okay. Is that okay, 7 o'clock? I'll Good. confirm that with the school. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Great. Um, last but not least, um, I did, um, as a custom, uh, we've incorporated a public uh, comment section. If there's anybody that would like to get up and speak, you can go to the podium and speak for um, two minutes. You're welcome to do so. Not seeing any, uh, we'll close public comment and uh, accept the motion to adjourn. So moved to adjourn. All in favor. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.